Hey there, welcome back to another season of Novel Conversations. Before we start the show, I wanted to recommend another great podcast about books. It's the Professional Book Nerds Podcast. If you enjoy listening to Novel Conversations, I think you'll really enjoy this podcast as well. The Professional Book Nerds Podcast offers up book recommendations and interviews your favorite authors every Monday and Thursday. Both Jill Grunenwald and Adam Sokol have spent their careers in the book world and have an inside look on exciting books you're going to love. In addition to their twice-a-week episodes, each month they preview the best new books coming out. They're not just book nerds, they're professional book nerds. Visit professionalbooknerds.com, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, or check them out on our own network, evergreenpodcast.com. All right, up next, Novel Conversations. Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. For each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. This conversation is about the novel Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis. And joining me in today's novel conversation are my guest readers, Katie Smith and Peter Toomey. Katie, Peter, hello. Hi, thank you. Thanks very much, Frank. Today we're going to talk about Till We Have Faces, a novel by C.S. Lewis, published in 1956, about seven years before his death. It's the story of two sisters, Oriol and Psyche, daughters of the King of Gloam. It's a barbarian country, and the king is obsessed with getting a son, and thereby cursed with three daughters. Oriol is a supremely ugly daughter. Psyche is just as beautiful as Oriol is ugly, and the third sister is the personification of greed and petty jealousy. Our story is written and narrated by the princess Oriol, and then she becomes Queen Oriol. She's the half-sister of Istra, also known as Psyche. The book follows Oriol down deep into her basic outlook about herself, her relationship with the gods, and most especially, her feelings for Psyche and her beloved slave, the fox a Greek philosopher who teaches Oriol his native language and looks after her. The story of these two sisters and the growth of their faith from the divine to the rational, and perhaps finally back to the divine, really makes up the bulk of our story. Now, I believe C.S. Lewis considered this his best work of fiction for adults. And we're going to do our best to make sure that the title gets out there and more people become more familiar with it. The book is called Till We Have Faces. The subtitle of the book is A Myth Retold. And the myth that C.S. Lewis is retelling is the myth of Cupid and Psyche. I'm going to just briefly go over that myth with you guys now, and then we'll talk about it. Were you guys at all familiar with the Cupid and Psyche myth before you read this book? Only a little. Certainly I know of those names. Yeah, the same. The characters, the names. But no, I'd never read the myth in detail. I was a little familiar with it, except, of course, my familiarity was completely wrong. I mean, I was thinking about the pond and the reflection in that story. Well, that's Narcissus. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Then I was thinking, you know, the guy with the bow and arrow, who is, in fact, Cupid, who shoots the arrows at Valentine's Day. So the short answer is no. (laughs) You know, I should point out for our listeners at home that C.S. Lewis includes a brief summary of the myth at the end of his book. Why didn't I read that first, Frank? (laughs) (laughs) I, I do not know the answer to that, Peter. He wants you to know that myth. He wants you to understand how his book is a myth retold. Well, I think it's a very important point because the conceit of why the book gets written is very much a part of the way that the myth had originally been stated. Now, Peter, don't go too much further there. We'll talk about how it was restated once I give you a bit of the background on the myth itself. Okay. The story of Cupid and Psyche starts with the birth of Psyche, and she's beautiful, the most beautiful child in the world. The most beautiful woman in the world is Venus, Aphrodite, and she's jealous. She becomes very jealous of our Psyche and sends her son, Cupid, to cast a spell on Psyche so that Psyche will marry or at least fall in love with the first common base man that she meets. Cupid goes to meet Psyche, and of course he falls in love with her himself. He takes Psyche to his palace, keeps her away from his mother, and tries to live happily ever after with her. Unfortunately, though, Psyche has two very jealous sisters, who at one point come to see her. 
And when Psyche tells them how much in love with her husband she is, they become even more jealous. She then tells her sister she's never actually seen her husband, that her husband requires her to keep the lights all out, and he sleeps with a cover over him. They convince her to try to find out who this husband is. She eventually takes a lantern into her bedchamber, turns the light on, and discovers Cupid. And Cupid, of course, is enraged. He's upset that she has disobeyed his one order. And he abandons her completely. Psyche then has to go through trials and tribulations. She wanders the world. She's a beggar woman. Eventually, she ends up in the palace of Venus, Aphrodite. And Aphrodite, in order to rehabilitate Psyche, gives her some tasks to perform. Psyche performs the tasks. Aphrodite is reconciled, and she allows her son Cupid to marry Psyche and make Psyche immortal. That's my little summary of the actual myth. Did that pretty much play the way you remember it? Well, it does play the way I remember it completely. (laughs) And the thing that I think was fascinating with Lewis's conceit for writing the book is that this is all in the person of the eldest daughter, Oriwell, who is a manly woman. She becomes a warrior queen. She's described as ugly of face, and she's extremely strong. She's a leader of men. She doesn't think much of most women, and she's really angry when she hears the myth the first time. The way it's told to her is that she and her sister trick Psyche out of jealousy to betray Psyche's husband, Cupid. Now, she's so enraged at this petty notion that she's jealous that she goes ahead and writes this book, her own account, and she calls it Till We Have Faces. First question for you, Katie. Can we really trust Oriole as a narrator? Does she tell us the truth? I believe that you can trust her as much as you can trust anyone's account of their own life. It's very much subjective. It's her experience, and she does tell you, I think, in the first chapter, that she's writing down her complaint against the gods because she feels that they've been unjust to her, and she's had a horrible life. She tells you up front that this is her complaint. And so you can trust her because this is what her experience has been. But you're warned from the get-go that perhaps there's more to the story than she's telling you. We're really only getting her subjective view of the events of the story as they occur around her and occur to her. Peter, do you trust her as a narrator? Yes, Frank, I, I definitely trust her as a narrator. Now, understand that she's very complex. The reason that she's trustworthy is that she tries so hard to be honest She becomes transparently dishonest in her attempt to be honest. And then finally, she herself actually recognizes it. And she's listening to this kind of huckster priest at one of these temples talk about this woman who is, in fact, Psyche, her sister, and telling this whole story. And this is the first she'd heard of the myth. She didn't know it existed. Right. He's a new priest telling her the story of a new goddess. That's right. There's a new goddess in town. New goddess on the scene. And this new goddess is our psyche. Our psyche. So she's fascinated. And the priest doesn't know that she's the queen, or Ariel, or I can't even pronounce it. Uh, Oriol. Oriol. Uh, or, or you, or you all. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> so, so she's a queen now, and she's traveling, and she says, and I quote, Jealousy? I jealous of Psyche? I sicken not only at the vileness of the lie, but at its flatness. If the gods are going to lie, could they not lie better than that? So what's happening, she's so enraged at this story about her sister, whom she's going to try to save from this fate worse than death. But now that noble quest has been reduced to her being jealous? Peter, that's a great point, but I want to mention that the part you read comes towards the end of our novel. Agreed. I want to bring us back a little bit to the beginning of the novel. Katie, you mentioned that the book is a complaint against the gods because of the life that she has had. And those complaints start out very early. What was the first injustice that she felt was done to her? Well, through her, you learn very early that when she was even a young child, she's so ugly that people respond in a very cruel manner, sometimes to her face. And they joke about it. And her father rejects her because of her appearance. She's very strong about it, though. She doesn't really feel sorry for herself. Or rather, she gets over that later in the book. But initially, she's angry at the gods for this injustice about her appearance. It definitely causes her a lot of pain early on. But you're right. Eventually, she comes to reconcile herself to her looks. But in the beginning, even before we meet her sister Psyche... She has another sister, Redival, I believe is the name of that sister. She's also a beautiful young girl. And in comparison, that makes Oriole feel even uglier. 
All right, Peter, let me ask you about some of Oriole's other injustices or her list. What Katie said is right. The book starts out, she's really upset, she's angry, and the first couple of pages are really tough. She says, I have a complaint. Now, I'm pretty certain what Lewis means, not just that she's a complainer and she's complaining, but she is a complainant in the legal sense. And she has this brief that she is going to bring against the gods. She has a laundry list of complaints. Her father doesn't love her. Her mother died when she was young. She has no chance of being married because she's ugly. She doesn't think she's going to have children. She's treated poorly by everybody, although she's really smart. And, and it goes on and on. Now, then, ultimately, and I think this is the main theme of the book, the way that she sees this whole situation with Psyche is not in terms of how Psyche feels about having been ripped from her family as a human sacrifice to Venus, but how Oriole feels about it herself. In other words, the way that she experienced this is through her self-absorption and how it affects her and that she's grieved by it. Now, when dear Psyche isn't properly moved by Oriole's grief— She's actually angry with her sister, even though it was her sister who was the victim. Now, to wrap that thought up, what's really going on here is that Lewis is saying, look, this is so typical of the way that people relate to the world. It's all about me. It's me, me, me. And this is the filter through which we humans see everything. And Peter, isn't that the story of our original myth? The original myth is told to us from Psyche's point of view? From Psyche's, absolutely. And it's what happens to Psyche. See, that's the point. It's how she discovers that she's with Cupid. It's how she is then left desolate. How she then has to perform the task for Aphrodite. And how she has to win her way back to Cupid and eventually um, immortality. C.S. Lewis takes the same myth, the same story, but he changes our point of view. He gives us the same story from Oriole's point of view. Right. And in the Psyche myth, Oriole is one of the mean sisters that tricks her into revealing who her husband is. In our story, Oriole considers herself the good sister, the wonderful sister who's out to try to save Psyche from this mysterious unknown husband. The brute. That's the retelling. <laughs> well, that's right. And it's a very proper retelling because we all believe that we're good. We all believe that we're right. We all believe that we're the good guys. And that includes criminals, by the way. 99% of everyone thinks they're doing the right thing for the right reasons. And of course, so does Oriol. Now, when we meet these girls, they're living in this country. They're the daughters of a king. And there's also a priest in the neighborhood and the goddess that these people pray to or sacrifice now, let's to. call her Venus. Let's call her, but in the novel, it's... Ungit. Ungit. Ungit? Okay. Ungit is the name they give their queen. We're introduced to another character, the fox, the Greek philosopher. He's the tutor for Psyche and for Oriole. He has a bit of a different perspective on religion. His perspective is, they're just stories. These are lies that poets tell us. Right, and I think that the fox represents rationalism, trying to explain everything through science. In the novel, there's a struggle struggling between believing the fox that everything can be explained through reason and science and then the beliefs that she's taught by her father and her people, believing in gods and goddesses and divine mysteries. That's exactly right. That's how C.S. Lewis sets it up. Right? He sets us up with the fox, the Greek philosopher, on the rational side of the discussion. He sets up Psyche, our beautiful princess, on the miraculous divine side of the argument. And then we have Oriole, who starts out believing in miracles, believing in gods and goddesses, eventually convinced somewhat by the fox to reason and rationality, and then again, towards the end, perhaps makes the journey back to believing in the miraculous and the divine. But Peter, back to her list of complaints, really her biggest complaint, the biggest thing that happens to her in her life, is when she gets a new sister, right? Her father, the king, is remarried. The stepmother lasts about a year, dies in childbirth, and the child she gives birth to is Psyche. Tell me a little bit about Psyche as we first meet her. Oh, she's the golden child. She is the spectacular light of hope. Everybody laughs around her, according to Oriol, who becomes her mother. Her mother, her sister, her guardian, her best friend, her everything, yeah, really. Her everything. So she's just this charming, lovely sunlight in the room all the time. And not only in the room, right? The whole town loves her. 
Yeah, yeah, and the whole kingdom, gloom, all of it, everyone. And here's where the problem begins, uh, although not right away. It doesn't take long that Venus becomes jealous, supposedly, of her beauty. But Venus is more than just the goddess of beauty. She's the goddess of beauty and love. And so there is this tremendous amount of outpouring of love to this gorgeous child. To Psyche. Yes, to Psyche. And Peter, you mentioned that Venus is now angered with jealousy over Psyche. And she begins to bring her wrath down upon the countryside and the country of Gloam. It starts with a plague, fevers, and then Katie progresses from there. Crop failures, there are political and military threats from other neighboring countries. That's right. The other countries are allying against the country of Gloam. Right. There are lions coming out of the hills to attack them. That's always bad. And tigers and bears, oh my, this just gets worse and worse. But now we need to solve this problem. And how does the king and Oriole decide that they're going to try to save the kingdom? Well, I don't know that the king and Oriole really make that decision. First of all, everybody's hungry. And so for the first time ever, they're pounding on the gates of the castle. And they're calling for this gorgeous, beautiful child because everybody has come to believe that just touching her or seeing her or touching the hem of her garment will heal them. And she goes out and she does that. And many... Well, some are cured, but not all are cured. uh, Some are cured and some aren't. She doesn't know if she's the cause of the curing or not, but it's all that she wants to do. She's a pleaser. She just wants to make people happy, and she's a very innocent child. But because she doesn't cure everyone, and as the book says, only the gods know who was cured by her touch and who was not cured by her touch, people do die. And certainly soon, the sentiment turns against our psyche. Right. The public turns on her, and then they want to sacrifice her. Or they want to make a sacrifice to the gods who are angry. And it's decided because she's so beautiful. And you have to make a beautiful sacrifice, not a criminal or something, that she's our gal. We're going to sacrifice her. And Oriole, she's so ugly. She not only is so ugly she can't get a husband, she's now so ugly she can't even be the sacrifice. She would willingly be the sacrifice for her sister. So the townspeople do decide they're going to sacrifice Psyche, and so our story goes. Well, the priest conspires with the people. Now, remember, the priest represents Venus. So the priest conspires with the people to decide that Psyche's the problem and that she's going to be sacrificed. Well, and not so much that Psyche's the problem, but there is a problem, and Psyche will be the sacrifice. No, I think that's true. Although, here's the thing, I think. I think that this is a very important point about the book. The problem with Psyche being more beautiful than Venus. Huh? Venus is the goddess, okay? And now we've got this mortal who's actually outshining the goddess, and that turns this pagan religion on its head. Because mortals are not supposed to be more attractive than gods. And that's the fundamental problem in this. It really does upset the order of things in this pagan environment. And I believe it's important to make that distinction. Because I do think that ultimately, that's a big part of what Lewis is going to tell us is going on here. My name is Cindy Burnett. And each week, I interview at least two traditionally published authors on my podcast, Thoughts from a Page. We talk spoiler-free about their books, so you can listen whether you have read the book or not. And then we delve into things that you most likely won't hear about anywhere else. The importance of the cover design, why they included various aspects of the story, personal details about both the books and the author's lives, and so much more. You can find the podcast on every major platform and learn more about it on my website, thoughtsfromapage.com. Thanks so much for checking it out. I'm not sure I've communicated that really well. No, Peter, I think you did. We're starting to get into the meat of this story here. Katie, you mentioned a confrontation. Perhaps, I don't know, I use that word now twice. Maybe it's not the right word. C.S. Lewis sets us up to have a discussion of reason and rationale versus the divine and the miraculous. You're right. And Orwell struggles with that throughout the book, trying to find, as we all do, the meaning of life and why she's here and why these things are happening to her. And she listens to the fox. Right. His reason and his rationale. Yes. And then... Bardia. Yes. And Bardia, who we haven't talked about yet. But Bardia, who represents the people and their belief in the divine. You don't agree with this setup. Uh, Yeah. I would like to set it up a little differently. I do think it's helpful to organize the competing arguments because you've got the fox. And Katie's absolutely right. It's all about rationalism. It is Greek. He's our Greek philosopher. 
Yes, he's our Greek philosopher, our Greek stoic, our Greek rationalist. And he talks about something called nature. But what he really means by nature, what Lewis is talking about, is science, that which is provable and that which is not. And he ridicules what this priest of Venus talks about, a need for human sacrifice because they sacrifice birds and pigs and all this other stuff. Well, that represents paganism, but it also represents emotionalism, you know, the heart. You know, it's kind of a superstitious way of going. I use the words miraculous or divine, I think. Now, those are the ones that I may take issue with because we all know that C.S. Lewis is a profoundly Christian writer. And I don't think that he's rejecting either miraculous or divine nature. He's also not rejecting rationalism. But he is saying, by themselves, neither one satisfies. And then the fox says this, quote, My magic, my ideas are so dry compared to these pagan priest ideas. <laughs> okay. And that's where this tension comes in. That's what's really fighting each other. And that's what Lewis tries in this really kind of amazingly layered way to make sense of. Isn't there a resolution at the end? Doesn't Oro come down on one side or the other of this argument? Well, that's a good question. Katie, what do you think? I think that ultimately she does decide to believe in the miraculous. Because the last chapter of the book is the answer of the gods to Oriel. And we do finally get to hear their defense of their treatment of her, which turns the whole thing on its head because you realize that at that point, this has been a very subjective telling of the story. Oh, yes, ma'am. You know, and I think for me the key is Psyche becomes immortal and Oriel accepts the immortality and the godness of her sister. That's not a rational belief. Yeah, I agree with you. Now here, I'll read you the last paragraph. This is Oriel writing just before she dies. And she says, I ended my first book with the words, no answer. I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. What other answer would suffice? Only words. Words to be let out to battle against other words. Long did I hate you. Long did I fear you. I might, you know, blah, 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 blah. So this title, it, it resonated. I don't think there's much in Lewis that doesn't have some older New Testament resonance to it, by the way. And really, the key to the title of the book itself is found near the book's end. It says, quote, Till the word can be dug out of us, why should the gods hear the babble that we think we mean? How can the gods meet us face to face till we have faces? End of quote. We have to be real before they're going to talk to us. And I said, I know what this is. And it's 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Quote, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. That's Paul writing to the people of the church at Corinth. And this is the very well-known faith and hope and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. You've all heard it. Well, he's saying, look, we don't see it all clearly now, but then... When we see things clearly, it won't be through a dark mirror. It will be face to face with the gods. And what Lewis is saying is, look, we can't see God face to face until we have faces, until we're real. And how does that come through in the novel? Talk to me about faces and facelessness in this novel. It's amazing stuff, and I think that's what C.S. Lewis is setting up. We start out with faceless gods. Then we start out with a faceless princess, a faceless queen. And then what happens to Oriol? She wears a veil, a veil all her life. She no longer even has a face. And when she puts on the veil, it's a very key part of the book, I think. It's when she really challenges her father. He ridicules her for putting the veil on. And she says, you cannot both ridicule my face and my covering up of my face. It's one or the other. And her father, at that point, does begin to respect her more. And she respects herself for standing up to him. Putting the veil on makes her a better queen because it hides herself from the people. And all these fabulous stories start to circulate about what's behind the veil after years go by. And people forget what she looked like. Right. These stories are fabulous. They say she's got the face of an elephant. She's got the face of a pig. Or perhaps the face of the most beautiful woman in the world. 
It's really come full circle for her. But this issue of asking, how do we get a face? I mean, that's really what's at the bottom of this. In other words, why does Psyche have a face? Oriol doesn't. The king never gets one. The fox has a certain face, but somehow it's insufficient. The pagan priest certainly has a face, but it's also insufficient. And the pagan goddess has no face. It's a stone. Venus has no face. She is a stone. And then, when under the influence of the Greek, the fox, sometime later when Oriel is the queen, they craft a new statue of the goddess. They give her a face. And she's, she's not accepted by the people, is she? That's right. No. They still continue to pray to the faceless stone. I think one of the keys is that Lewis points to the talks about language and telling it straight. And Oruel says from the time that she was three years old, Psyche told it straight. She never minced words. She was always clear. She told the truth. Psyche, in a confrontation with Orwell, at one point says, Never in my life have I ever told you a lie. And I believe Lewis is saying we get faces by being authentic. We get faces by being real. This is how we can get in touch with the truth with a small t in ourselves and the truth with a big t outside of ourselves. And it's the difference between art and artifice. It's the difference between connivance and being real and being true. It's self-knowledge versus self-delusion. That's right. And as you said before, you can't know your God until you know yourself. There's a political line that says, I don't know where you're sitting until I know where you're standing. Until you know where I'm coming from, my opinions, my stance don't make any sense to you. We know where Oriel now is coming from, and I think in the end, her beliefs make sense to her, and they make sense to me. Well, she does come around. She has an epiphany and changes. Really, she has two epiphanies. I'm going to continue to argue that she starts out as a believer in the miraculous and in the holy and in the goddess, and eventually comes to Fox's point of view, the Greek's point of view of rationalism, of reason. But then in the end, her second epiphany, I think, she does come back and accept the miraculous. Hmm. I agree with you completely on that. Thanks. But where we'll just agree to disagree is that I think, and this is my opinion, of course, that C.S. Lewis is saying that she starts out with a false religion of the miraculous and the divine and ultimately comes to a true religion. I think that's where Lewis is coming from. And Peter, I can absolutely accept that. All right, let's get into the last segment of this show. This is the part of the program where I'd like to ask if you have some favorite lines or perhaps a favorite moment. Talk to us about something we may not have had a chance to get to. Katie, let's start with you. Well, I found Orwell to be such a compelling and interesting narrator because she's so human. And the things that she struggles with, I think, are things that all thoughtful people struggle with. Things happen to her and she struggles to understand why, why the gods are doing this to her. There are many lines in the book where she's expressing these things, and it's not always complaining. It's often just a desire to understand. There's a particular segment towards the end of her section of the book. Referring to the gods, she writes, They would give no clear sign, though I begged for it. I had to guess. And because I guessed wrong, they punished me. And what's worse, punished me through her. And she's referring to Psyche. And even that was not enough. They have now sent out a lying story in which I was given no riddle to guess, but knew and saw that she was God's bride. I think that everyone has struggles in their lives and they look at this and they think, why does this have to happen to me? And what's wonderful about the book is that then she's given the answer. And I think the answer that we all hope for is that after this life, we'll understand why these things had to happen the way that they did. And she understands in the end that the gods or the divine is wiser than she is, and she gets her answers. That's very good. Peter? Well, I have two passages. Uh, Psyche, I think, is the primary kind of Christ figure in the book. And I love the line where they say, Psyche could speak plain when she was three. We were talking earlier about how do you know yourself? How do you get to have a face? How do you develop a face? Well, I suppose it's easier if you could speak plain when you're starting at the age of three. The other thing I love, and it goes right to where you were talking about, the whole thing is a complaint. It's a complaint against the God. It really is a screed against God. And so consequently, it's... Until the very end. uh, Well, yeah, until the very end. So 
she's now near the very end, and she's about to get judged. She's made her case, and then she says, well, okay, now what? And they say, now the gods that have been accused, they get to answer. So she asks, I can't hope for mercy, and asks, are the gods not just? <laughs> and she's told, oh, no, child, what would become of us if they were? In other words, what Lewis is saying is no. If God were just and we got what we deserved, there would be nothing but fire and brimstone or any other way you want to put that. We'd all be ugly queens. We would all be really <laughs> ugly queens. <laughs> Let me read to you a line that I like. This comes towards the end of the novel, and Oriol has come to realize that she does have these complaints against the gods and that she's got to write them down. She has to tell her story. And she says, I understand more clearly I could never be at peace again until I had written my charge against the gods. It burned me from within. It quickened. I was with book as a woman is with child. Boy, to me, that's a great line. That is a great line. That's a fantastic line. And, you know, that's a writer's line. It is indeed. So these themes we're talking about, they are so universal. They're so deep. They're so powerful. And that's why this story is just... I mean, if you're listening to this, folks, get the book. It's really a great one. And... Probably one of the best books I've read in a, so long a time. And Katie, Peter, that's what I always tell my guests. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say always, but I sometimes tell my guests that for me, that's what makes a book great, is that it's timely and timeless. All right, that does it for this week's conversation on the novel, Till We Have Faces, a myth retold by C.S. Lewis. I want to thank my Novel Conversations readers for coming in today, Peter Toomey and Katie Smith. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. My pleasure. Our pleasure. Great time. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Oh, very much. Yeah, very much so. Thanks again. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. Novel Conversations is a production of Evergreen Podcasts, formerly the Front Porch People. If you'd like to hear more Novel Conversations, you can go to our new network at evergreenpodcast.com or listen on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. It really helps. Novel Conversations was produced by Julie Fink and engineered by Sean Rule Hoffman. A special thanks to our executive producer, Joan Andrews, and our researchers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. And I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. My name is Cindy Burnett, and each week I interview at least two traditionally published authors on my podcast, Thoughts from a Page. We talk spoiler-free about their books, so you can listen whether you have read the book or not. And then we delve into things that you most likely won't hear about anywhere else. The importance of the cover design, why they included various aspects of the story, personal details about both the books and the author's lives, and so much more. You can find the podcast on every major platform and learn more about it on my website, thoughtsfromapage.com. Thanks so much for checking it out. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.